Okay. There we go. So let's start. Uh, welcome everybody to the seminar of uh, today. Uh, the speaker of today is uh, Charles Menevo, and uh, he will talk about an update on the Turbulence Database and its uh, application to uh, elucidating uh, uh, geometric scaling properties of turbulent spots during boundary layer bypass transition. Uh, he is uh, uh, in the Luis uh, Sardella professor, is at the Luis Sardella uh, Says you said that the professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, he's associate director uh, of the Institute of uh, Data Intensive Engineering and Science, and uh, is jointly appointed as professor of the Department of uh, Physics and Astronomy at John Hopkins. He receives his uh, bachelor in uh, mechanical engineering from the Universidad Tecnica uh, Federico Santa Maria in uh, Valparaiso, Chile, in uh, 1985 and his uh, master's and uh, PhD degrees from Yale University in 87, 1987, 88, and, and uh, 1989, respectively. During 1989 and 1990, he was a postdoctoral fellow at the Center of uh, Turbulence Research at Stanford. Uh, he has been at the John Hopkins faculty uh, since 1990, and during 2000, he was on sabbatical uh, at École Centrale de Paris. Uh, his area of research is focused on uh, understanding and modeling hydrodynamic turbulence and complexity in fluid mechanics in general. Uh, the insights that have emerged from uh, Professor Menevo's uh, uh, work uh, have led uh, to new numerical uh, models for large eddy simulations and uh, applications in engineering and environmental flows, including wind forms. Uh, he also focused on uh, developing methods uh, to share the very large data set that arise in uh, computational fluid dynamics. He's a deputy editor of the Journal of Fluid Mechanics and has served as editor-in-chief uh, of the Journal of Turbulence. Uh, Professor Menevo is uh, a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, a foreign corresponding member of the Chilean Academy of Science, a fellow of APS, ASME, AMS, and recipient of the Stanley uh, Corsin uh, Award for the APS and the JHU uh, Alumni uh, Association Sex and Dance and Teaching Award and the APS Francois uh, uh, Frankel Award uh, for Fluid Mechanics. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, uh, Professor Menevo for, uh, for the talk shop. I leave you the stage. Thank you very much, Francesco, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be addressing uh, this uh, group uh, in this way. I would much rather be in Lille in person. Uh, normally there would be a nice uh, lunch afterwards, uh, whereas here I'll, I'll just have to have lunch at, at my house. But uh, anyhow, it's, uh, this is certainly much better than nothing. And it's also a real pleasure to see a number of, uh, of old friends, especially in Europe, that uh, I haven't seen in person for a long time. So, uh, it's, uh, so thank you again, Francesco. And also, one thing you didn't mention in, in my bio, I, I got my PhD degree from Srinivasan while he was at Yale, and I understand he, he gave the uh, last of these lectures. So it's a, it's a real pleasure, of course, uh, and I, I, of course, I'm always following Srini uh, uh, for, for, for quite a while. So uh, it's a pleasure to be addressing you here. Uh, what I will do now is try to share my screen um, and uh, start with the presentation. Uh, one thing I maybe want to do is uh, figure out a pointer. Uh, we, we see your pointer. You see the pointer? Okay, yes. very good. So then it's I will. Uh, too. Okay, okay, very good. So then this is good. So uh, what I, I'd like to do is really a two-part presentation. Uh, one, give you an update on on something I, I a system that I believe many of you are familiar with the the turbulence database that we're hosting um, and uh, and. Uh, and then I uh, use some of the data uh, to address one specific uh, item. And this is a uh, work done with a former postdoc, Zhao Wu, who is now at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and my colleague, uh, Tamer Zaki from Hopkins. Uh, so those are, uh, that's kind of a, uh, uh, what I'd like to cover today. Um, so as outlined, um, I'll, I'll tell you about the motivation uh, in, in computational fluid dynamics and turbulence research. There really is uh, something that one might call inequality uh, in this context, uh, which is sort of the high performance computing resource gap. 
Uh, I'll, uh, I'll describe uh, a possible approach to circumvent that uh, bottleneck, uh, which in our view is this notion of web services accessible data sets. Uh, and I'll describe the system and, and some update and new data sets that we have uh, recently ingested into the system. And then really the, the scientific part, if you will, of the talk will be to use a, a data set on transitional boundary layer uh, turbulence um, to uh, study a particular feature of uh, turbulent spots um, and, and to see whether we can discern any high Reynolds number scaling yeah, at, at these at the moderate Reynolds numbers that uh, occur when you have a uh, bypass transition. So that, that's going to be the, the, the outline of, of the presentation. And uh, let me go here. So uh, again, I think uh, we all know, right, the largest DNS have grown uh, very rapidly following Moore's law. And then it, in some sense, if you, if you calculate how much data is being generated, if you think of the entire time uh, evolution, it's uh, multiple terabytes, petabytes of data that are being used. And, but then typically the way we proceed is we condense this into mean profile spectra PDFs. Maybe we store a few uh, snapshots for flow visualization. Maybe we'll build an animation, but most of the simulation itself, uh, all that data in some sense gets, is lost. And it's, it's very difficult to transmit and share with others. Uh, there are uh, uh, some excellent uh, community databases, again, that have focused on turbulent statistics, for example, of NASA Lamley, with Chris Rumsey and, uh, and, and Jimenez and, and Moser, uh, and Channel Flow, uh, Turbbase, uh, Erkov Tech, and so on. Um, but it's, it, we are there, we're really not sharing the full 4D data sets, uh, obviously, because they're very, very large and it's very difficult for others to reanalyze. And I, and I believe uh, this really has limited to some degree the impact of uh, high performance computing on, on science and engineering. Uh, just again, you're, you're all very familiar with this, how things have grown and, and I'll focus mainly on, on some very kind of canonical, very basic turbulent flows, for example, isotropic uh, turbulence or channel flow. Uh, the size of these simulations, the way they've grown in the last two decades, uh, just as a summary uh, uh, shown here, uh, for example, here is a, here's an example uh, that, that was generated by P.K. Young, of forced isotropic turbulence on 8,000 uh, cube grid points. Um, if, you, you know, if, you, if you were to store uh, 10 to the four time steps of this, it, it, it's just a, a massive, uh, it's a massive amounts of data. Uh, typically, uh, the way P.K. Uh, stores these data is essentially flat output files in Fourier space. That's, uh, that's what's being used also for restart simulations. And so if now somebody asks PK, oh, uh, I'd, like, uh, I'd like to calculate the PDF of vorticity from this, uh, then, then, then you have to you know, download a file that, that has the Fourier coefficients. You need to figure out how they've been stored, which FFT, you know, which way things were, uh, were, were stored. You have to do an inverse FFT, uh, which now you know, to do this for 8,000 cube uh, grid points is a tremendous endeavor. You have to do it in parallel with multiple processors. You need, a, a, even just to analyze this, uh, you'll need a, a access to a big machine. Um, so again, very difficult for others to use. And, and essentially what we'd like to uh, facilitate is, for example, if a mathematician simply wants to follow a, a, a material line and see how it's being deformed in isotropic turbulence, and, once, and this is somebody who cannot do DNS by him or herself, or for example, experimentalists that wish to place particles in the flow and see how they're being moved uh, uh, to maybe test the new PIV method. Uh, and then also for teaching and outreach, uh, for teaching to allow students of a turbulence class, for example, to, 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 to access very large data sets, but in a very easy way. So those, those are kind of the motivations that we had a long time ago to start the system. And it was actually um, uh, inspired by uh, astronomy. So I have a colleague at Hopkins, Alex Saleh, who about uh, over 20 years ago started the so-called Sky Server, which is uh, essentially a web accessible uh, repository of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, and they've essentially spent a lot of effort building web services interfaces to those uh, data. And, and again, they, they, they started out small and then it kept growing and, and became kind of a big system. So we thought, let's do something similar for turbulence. And uh, that's, uh, that's what gave rise to the, to, the, to, this, uh, to the system. And so essentially what we've done is we've taken DNS data and we've chopped it up into little pieces and stored them in, uh, in, in disks in, in, in a particular format uh, that I'll talk a little bit about. 
And, uh, and then on top of that, we've built uh, web services that can then be addressed over the, the, the web uh, by users that are anywhere in the world. And uh, we've facilitated essentially a number of different ways to access the data. One, just manual queries, uh, running programs or Fortran and C and MATLAB and Python. Um, and I'll, I'll illustrate some of these. Um, in the meantime, we've also been growing the number of data sets we have available. So right now we have nine uh, uh, flows and, uh, and uh, it, it adds up to about half a petabyte of data right now. Um, the, first, the first data set that we ingested into the system, it's quite a while ago now, so over 12 years ago, was a, a full uh, a 5,000 uh, time step space time history. And that this was about five turnover times, eddy turnover times of a 1,000 cube uh, DNS. Again, 1,000 cube nowadays, uh, many people can do it, but, uh, but still, uh, even, even the people who can do it, they still come to the database to use it just because the access is so easy and you can reuse uh, easily, especially if you need subsets of the data. Um, and then the most recent, uh, 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 ingestion was uh, just a few months ago. Uh, the uh, snapshots, not time evolution, because uh, we just don't have the space for that, uh, of a 8,000 cube uh, DNS from uh, Georgia Tech. And here are the spectra, and again, here are some visualizations of, of that flood. Um, so when we designed the database, the, some of the, you know, the, the things you want to do is to have the operations, the calculations done as close as possible to the data so, so that you don't have to uh, um, transport too much of the data. And, um, but now the, the question is what, what operations would we pre-program into the system? And that's where fluid dynamics is a little, or especially turbulence research is, uh, is a little bit uh, unique because you know, while there are a few generic things uh, most users have their very own uh, 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 things they want to query. And so it was quite difficult to decide what things to do. So we decided on the, on the side of uh, um, easy and very basic things. So for example, just take derivative differentiation, spatial and temporal interpolation, and then fluid particle tracking seemed to like for Lagrangian studies, that seemed to be a, a, a one. And then one that, that I've been of course, uh, interested also to analyze data from the point of view of uh, large eddy simulation is to do spatial filtering of, of data. Um, so that those are the kind of operations that we've pre-programmed that are done then on the system very close to the data. And, uh, and then the other thing that I, I thought was very interesting, and, and this we did copy also from the astronomers, uh, the way they store the data on the, on the sky. There it's in 2D, it's essentially on the, on the, on the semi-hemisphere, but uh, here it's in 3D. Uh, which is how to store the data. And, and the idea is uh, we're going to zoom in and on a particular location in 3D space. Uh, if you wanted, for example, an interpolation or a differentiation, you'll have some stencil that will involve some points in its uh, 3D environment. And if you store data the usual way along, uh, uh, you know, along IJK indices, uh, maybe they'll be th those data will be close in one index, but then it will be very far in the other one, and the third index will be they'll be on entirely different positions. So it, it becomes very difficult to join uh, data together uh, that are spatially very close, but uh, might be very uh, separate in these other indices. And so uh, we use a space filling fractal curve, uh, which essentially uh, uh, zips through the through the data set in a in a in a space filling curve. And the property of this kind of uh, octree uh, Z curve is, uh, is that points that are close by in 3D are reasonably close along this, uh, this line as well. And so that, uh, that has facilitated uh, access speeds uh, quite a bit. So we use that to how, this is how we order the data. So we don't use IJK uh, index, but we use this, uh, this kind of index. And then perhaps most importantly for users is how do we, how do we access the data? And here we, uh, we are uh, uh, we're really uh, you know, eager to show this um, this notion of uh, virtual sensors. So the idea is for the user, all you want to really prescribe is I want the data, let's say the velocity or the pressure or the velocity gradients or pressure Heskin or pressure gradient. I want it at this position and at this time in this data set. Um, and so that's what you prescribe. So you don't prescribe, uh, you know, I want to download a file that I don't know how it's been formatted, but I want the data at those points. So we call these the virtual sensors. And then of course you can do not individual sensors only, but entire sensor arrays in which you initialize position vectors 
And then the return from the database are uh, these data velocity, velocity gradients at all these uh, arrays of points. And, um, and the notion is that uh, you might be running a, a program in your computer on C, Fortran or Python or MATLAB and uh, uh, while you execute your analysis program, there are calls to the database that are made, and uh, and it, on return, uh, it will um, it will uh, provide you the desired data. Um, so uh, this is probably the simplest one, and you know if, if I had more time, I could kind of illustrate this here uh, live, but maybe it's better to just show you the slide. But certainly, if you go if you go to this website, you can try it yourself. So the idea is, you know, here you can just specify X, Y, Z, the position, the time, you click on the data set you want, uh, uh, what you want, for example, you get velocity gradient, you click on query, and, you know, fractions of a second later, you get the nine components of the velocity gradient tensor at that position at that time for this flow. Right? And so it, uh, you can use this part of the website to see what services are uh, available. Um, and then uh, essentially the way to then access it in a more massive way when you need many points, the data at many points is to run, for example, you can run on your own machine, a MATLAB uh, code that would, um, that would uh, look a little bit like this. So you initialize points, again, the array of points, um, and then uh, there's a get velocity command that will specify the data set, the time, how to interpolate, uh, number of points, and then the array that has the points, and on return, you get the velocity. And this, this is how these plots, for example, were generated out of an 8,000 uh, uh, cube uh, data set. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's essentially very easy. Again, if you want to download the entire three-dimensional field at all times, this will take forever and it's not efficient. This is an access mode where you know particular subsets of the data, for example, a single plane or a line or things as a function of time. And this is where, uh, uh, how this can be made available. And it turns out a lot of times that's really all we, uh, what, we, what we want. Um, other other uh, approaches are uh, cutout service. So here, for example, you might, uh, this, this is a method which is also served by this browser, but can also be invoked from Python code. Um, you would uh, specify a, a cube in the data, like a subcube, uh, and uh, you essentially tell it uh, which index to start, i, j, k, uh, the end, initial and end points and the stride. And then, uh, and then this will uh, return an HDF, the five uh, file, a standard one that you can then visualize in pair of you. By the way, my, if you look at my background, uh, that's uh, from the isotropic turbulence data set. And if you look closely, it, it actually involves in time. So it took me about five minutes to, uh, to do this. Uh, I just downloaded uh, an array with this way and then visualize it in pair of you and let's just save the movie. So very, very easy uh, uh, to do. So you're, you're welcome to use this uh, even for simply, uh, 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 cosmetic uh, purposes uh, for your uh, web browser, for example. So, so this is also, uh, this is a more traditional approach, if you will, to download a, a, a file, a flat file uh, in a subcube of the data. Um, and then in terms of, so th those are the ways to access the data. Um, let me just quickly go over the data sets themselves uh, that we have. So again, a long time ago, we, uh, we also uh, created a 1000 uh, cube and then stored 1000 time steps of uh, MHD turbulence. Now here we're storing the velocity, the pressure, but also the magnetic field and the magnetic potential. Um, um, we have a, a time, a full time evolution, again, about uh, 4000 time steps of a RE tau 1000 channel flow, um, which was generated using Bob Moser's code. Um, this is about 110 terabytes. Um, we have from uh, Los Alamos, uh, we have a, a, a buoyancy driven turbulence flow in which we now also store the density field. Here's a snapshot. Again, here we have the time evolution on a thousand time steps. Um, then, then here we have 4,000 cube data sets from isotropic and rotating stratified turbulence, the latter ones from NCAR, uh, where we also have temperature stored. Um, but these are now, again, uh, not the entire time evolution, just individual snapshots, um, simply because of uh, problems of not having big enough disks. But, uh, but uh, we are probably getting new disks, so these things can, uh, can be made bigger. This is the transitional boundary layer data that was uh, uh, generated by a uh, postdoc, former postdoc, Dr. Jin Lee and, and, and Professor Kamerzaki uh, with his code. 
And uh, here, uh, so this, this is the data set that I'll talk a little more about in the second part. So this is bypass transition. Uh, it's just a snapshot. You can see the computational dom domain is, is seen here and the data is stored on this black uh, uh, rectangular box that you can see. And here again, we have, uh, we have uh, several thousand time steps stored. So here we can follow the time evolution individually of each of these spots, for example, as they move, as they merge and so on. So it's been quite interesting uh, to do this. And, and I will talk uh, more about this data set in a few minutes. Um, then we have a uh, RE Tau 5200, uh, again, now snapshots only. These are data uh, generated in Texas by MK Lee and, and Bob Moser. Um, and uh, again, there's, you know, now there's uh, you know, RE Tau 8000 and, and, and perhaps later even bigger ones uh, that are being generated. So, uh, but again, for, for a random user to generate uh, that kind of uh, DNS is, uh, of course, very difficult. And so the data being available in this easy fashion, I do think, has, has been quite uh, helpful. Uh, it's been used for research. Uh, there's, I think at this point, there's probably over 200 peer-reviewed papers based on the data. And you can see it's been kind of growing and now it's about 50 papers uh, a year is kind of the, the situation that uh, we have now. And again, what, um, what, what this allows us to do and, and ourselves included, uh, we also have ac easy access to this data. So I, you know, a new student comes in, I can uh, get the student up and running right away uh, to do some interesting visualization or analysis. Here, for example, is something we did quite a few years ago now, but it gives a, it gives a good uh, a visualization or of, of, of something one might think, you know, what would it look like if I do, uh, if I coarse grain the velocity with a filter that corresponds, for example, to the gray isosurface of vorticity, the red ones, by the way, are isosurfaces of unfiltered vorticity. So that's a real vorticity field. Uh, this is a, a subset of the isotropic turbulence data set at the uh, RE Tau 1, uh, our, our, our Lambda 400. Um, and what would, look, what, what, what would it look like if I only look at the small scale vortices inside the big scale vortex and I take out and I don't visualize the vortices that are outside of this. Uh, so that's why the white regions outside are simply regions where the, where the vorticity, the small scale vorticity is more randomly aligned such that its filtered versions don't have the view, you know, don't generate these large scale vortices. And what does it look like? And so quite interesting, you can see the sort of twisting of the small scale vorticity by the larger scale vorticity. And here we have kind of a, a hierarchy of three, of three scales to sort of show the, maybe the energy cascade, how the energy is being uh, transferred to smaller scales through this kind of twisting and stretching of small scale vortices by the large scale. But the large scale is simply an agglomeration of the small scale. So, it's a, so you, can, you can do very, uh, very concentrated, very focused uh, analysis. And then we can come back to this very same region over and over again you know, a year later, somebody can come and just, you know, ask a very specific question about one of these vortices, and it's very easy to, to access. So, um, yeah, so that's a, that's a quick update on the, on the system that I, I did want to tell you about. And um, maybe now let me go to the uh, second part, uh, which was a study that was, again, really facilitated by us having uh, this very simple access to data uh, uh, in, in, in this very simple, simple way. And uh, the research question we'd like to address here is focused on the, on the evolution of these turbulent spots during bypass transition. Um, how do they evolve? Uh, obviously, many people have looked at this. There's a lot of literature on it. And, uh, and here we'd like to focus on a particular question, which is um, a number of people have also found commonalities between high Reynolds number turbulence and what's actually happening inside these spots. So we wanted to rephrase or re-ask that question in the, in the context of, uh, of, uh, of a more geometric scaling analysis, something that, that I've been interested for a while. Uh, and so, so here we, we specifically asked the question, uh, can we say something about the fractal geometry of the turbulent non-turbulent interface or, or the turbulent, yeah, turbulent non-turbulent interface uh, associated with these individual turbulent spots. Um, do they display any kind of uh, similarity to what happens at high Reynolds numbers? So that, that was the question we, um, we, we thought we would address. Then when you, when, you, when you do this, when you pose a question like this, the first question is how am I going to 
uh, identify this uh, turbulent, non-turbulent interface, right? So if I look at this picture, it's kind of obvious what, what are the turbulent regions, right? Here, for example, I have a spot, you have a spot. On the right is the fully turbulent region that has arisen by the merger and the downstream evolution of these spots. Um, and, uh, but, but how exactly, how am I gonna determine this interface, which is of course a bit of a, in three dimensions, it's of course a skin-like structure uh, surrounding the spot. Uh, how am I going to identify it? Um, and this is, of course, a kind of an old topic. Uh, many of you are, are, are very familiar with it. Uh, it has an old history, uh, starting with uh, Corson and Kistler, and, the, and the, actually Corson, even in his thesis uh, on jets, made some observations about outer intermittency, so this, this very sharp boundary between turbulence and non-turbulence. Here are some visualizations. Um, and the question is, how do, how do I identify an interface um, I would say the most often used approach is based on thresholds, and I have a few references here. Um, so you set a threshold on a quantity that you associate with turbulence. Uh, for example, vorticity is a, is a good example. Um, so vorticity magnitude, um, and you set a threshold, everything above it will be turbulent, everything below would be laminar. Um, or, uh, for example, you could say kinetic energy uh, of the flow point-wise, uh, turbulent kinetic energy, you set a threshold. The fluctuations are bigger than uh, it's turbulent. Uh, that, that, that's something, for example, that we use uh, with uh, Ivan Marusic uh, in an analysis of turbulent PIV data and turbulent boundary layers. Excuse me, I have a glass of water here. So, um, <clears throat> One of the challenges with these threshold-based uh, approaches, and there are ways of mitigating those, but still I think uh, there, there's this challenge that most of the times there's some dependence on the threshold that, uh, that you choose. And, and, and typically I'll tell you what people do is they set a threshold that sounds reasonable. Then you look at visualizations and if the interface that's determined by that threshold works well, like here, for example, I think this, this was very nice with this PID data, uh, then you declare success and that's it. But it still requires this human intervention of saying, ah, this, this doesn't make sense. And sometimes there's uh, further adjustments. So we thought, uh, well, this, um, so here, for example, I show another view of the, of the, of the, of the database uh, for this developing uh, boundary layer with the spots. Um, this is something where if I look at it as a human, uh, I see these spots and I can immediately tell whether it's turbulent or not. And so this kind of pattern recognition or classification is, of course, something where uh, machine learning, which, of course, is an area that, uh, that is exploding and has been exploding for a while. Um, so, so, so we thought, well, let's, uh, let's try a machine learning technique applied to this turbulent, non-turbulent interface detection, simply based on this insight that certainly machine learning has been very successful at telling apart, for example, dogs and cats from your uh, video uh, or, or photo library. And uh, so let's apply it here to separate turbulent from non-turbulent interfaces. And so our former postdoc, uh, Dr. Zhao Wu, what, he, um, what he, he did, he said, well, let's, let me try something, uh, which is a self-organized map, uh, which is an unsupervised machine learning uh, clustering approach. And he said, every point in the flow, I'm gonna characterize with some variables. And he picked um, velocity fluctuations. He picked velocity gradients. <coughs> Excuse me. And in this flow, he also picked locations of so the downstream and the Y location. Um, and um, and he he just asked the the map to cluster it into two groups. And so the way this works is, if there are two clusters of the data in some high-dimensional hyperspace, you visualize just in two D. Uh, this will iteratively find the centroid of these two, and then it'll put a hyperplane in the middle between the two centroids, and we'll just declare class A is everything on one side, class B is on the other side, and there's, there's been no training. I, I, you know, we, didn't, we didn't give it another data set where we knew what was turbulent and what was laminar, because that would defeat the purpose, right? We, we ourselves don't, uh, don't know how to uh, do this in, a, in an objective way. Uh, other than subjectively looking at the picture. So, so unsupervised, I think that was important. And he tried it and he came back to uh, Tamer and I uh, the day after and showed us the results. And, and this, is what, uh, this is what kind of pictures he started showing us right away. Uh, the black line here was the interface that he determined. So um, it was quite interesting that it was uh, so quickly successful. So let me just go a little bit more in detail at what exactly he did. 
So he uh, as variables. Uh, so again, this phase space is now 16 dimensional. Uh, there is the velo velocity and the velocity fluctuation. So both of them, because the mean might have some uh, input, so they're not exactly the same. <clears throat> things are have, you know, there's an absolute value placed there. So it's really just the magnitude of things. Um, and one could imagine, for example, further improvements of this, right, where you would base it on the invariance of the velocity gradient. But again, this is a channel flow that's spatially developing. So nothing really is directionally invariant and all the directions have special meaning anyhow. So we thought this is fine. Uh, again, same with the locations. And now for this machine learning stuff to work, uh, I think people you know, working on neural network know this as well. It's, it's good to have everything kind of normalized so that things go you know, roughly with a four to one to zero and one uh, kind of thing. So we, we normalize all of the variables with, with their own standard deviation over the data set. And the data set is the full uh, field, uh, including laminar and turbulent regions, the full three-dimensional field. And, uh, and we've done it per snapshots, but you could also do it including many other times. Um, and uh, again, the method is asked to classify this into two groups. And then there's one post-processing step that is uh, done which is in the turbulent regions, uh, even after doing this, you find a lot of tiny little one or two pixel type holes that, uh, that, that, would have, that were classified as laminar. So those get uh, filled by a, uh, by a sort of an image processing tool uh, technique called binary dilation and, and erosion kind of thing. So, so that the smallest little lakes that form, they are still categorized catalog as turbulent. That, that was one post-processing step. Again, no, no uh, threshold had to be set for that. Uh, and anyway, the technique, there's a, this is the paper that describes this. And uh, again, on the right, you see kind of the, the type of picture that uh, Zhao showed us uh, the very first day, uh, which really caught our attention um, and, uh, and you know, convinced us to pursue this. And on the left, what you see is a subset uh, right at the wall. So it turns out that on the wall at y equals zero, uh, the 16 dimensional uh, space kind of collapses onto just three, which are the vertical gradients of streamwise and spanwise velocity and the X location. Y is of course equal to zero and all the other terms are zero. So it's nice because here I can actually tell you how this is done, right? So here's the, the space is now three dimensional. The two gradients are you know, vertical and one of the horizontal lines, and then the x, x direction is the other horizontal line. And what you can see is uh, that all the points have clustered, and again, this, the method has automatically clustered them into red and green. The red, obviously, uh, although we surmise that's the turbulent regions, and the green, this kind of little sausage here, uh, that's the laminar, those are laminar regions. And, uh, and the hyperplane that it's decided uh, uh, to put is equidistance from the two centroids is this uh, triangular shape there. So everything on one side is turbulent, everything on the left is uh, on the other side is laminar. And when you take that hyperplane and you plot the hyperplane in physical units, you get this black line, which I think is quite uh, remarkable. And again, visually it just uh, does seem to work quite well. Notice that, uh, you know, there are there are places where velocity gradients are very large in the laminar portion, and still they're cataloged as laminar. Uh, and so it's somewhat non-trivial the way it's found, right? So the fact that this plane is really inclined and not parallel tells you that if you had just set a threshold on one of these gradients, I would have, you know, would have been terrible. Uh, so anyway, this gives you a sense of how this works, but again, the real thing is in 16 dimensions. So, um, now this is the situation in 3D. So um, the three-dimensional interface that's been determined this way is shown here. The colors are height above the wall and the spots are, well, these are the spots. This is one snapshot, the, the blue, this is the surface, this is the wall now and everything laminar is of course here on the left and the turbulence is below the skin. And A, B are two, snap, are two uh, spots. So we've replotted them here at one time. And then at a later time, these two spots evolve. They grow typically, most of them grow, some of them die out. Uh, most of them grow, they merge, and then here's form one big spot at some later time. And again, having the database and this easy access, you know, every time I can go back to spot A and ask another question, it just makes it just very easy for us to go back and forth and ask these kinds of questions. So now what are we gonna do with this? Again, I, I, I hinted that I was gonna be interested in some kind of scaling property of this uh, interface. So uh, for this, maybe I need to go back a little bit and, and, and kind of try to convince you of, uh, or, or, or just to 
review some rather old material, but um, I believe that you know when you look at a cumulus cloud, uh, like what you see on the right, I believe that is probably the most visible manifestation of the Kolmogorov cascade of turbulence. Uh, you know, big eddies stretch or generate these big bulges of, of a scalar marker, which in this case are tiny water droplets in the cloud. Um, then that's uh, you know smaller scale eddies bulge it at smaller scale, then so on and so forth. Right? So I think this is very visible. And um, as it turns out, there's this measurements of the fractal nature of this uh, kind of surface have been known. And let me let me uh, tell you or, or just review a very old argument how this is possibly related to Kolmogorov scaling. <clears throat> and the way to, to make the connection is to imagine that you have the turbulent non-turbulent interface, which here is uh, marked in black. This is, these are from PIV measurements uh, uh, done earlier with a with group of uh, Ivan Marusic in, in Melbourne. And uh, what you see here has been determined by the kinetic energy uh, uh, criteria, not the machine learning criteria that's more recent. So it was from 2013, so we didn't have that idea yet. But anyway, here, here's the interface determined that way. You can, you can filter like we do in LES, the fields and then re-ask the question, what's the interface like? And so the large scale interface is much smoother, has a smaller surface area, if you will, as you go to smaller scales, you start seeing more and more wheel wiggles. So let's think of it in terms of filtering this at different scales. And at any arbitrary scale R, the idea will be to write the scalar, which is the, the flux, the flux of whatever scalar we imagine is diffusing across this interface. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll try to, write the, um, you know, an expression for this flux as essentially using fixed law, but with an effective diffusion coefficient, which might depend on scale R. Delta C is the difference in concentration, the gradient, so this is DC, DR, right? The, the normal gradient of the concentration, this is the total surface area. So this is the total flux occurring over a macroscopic region. So, sorry, here I'm asking you please to follow this kind of, uh, Detailed derivation is very simple, but uh, it's kind of in, in, in instructive and interesting. So again, diffusion coefficient, so fixed law at scale R, diffusion coefficient, gradient, so total surface area. Um, and what's crucial though, is that this delta C, this concentration difference is constant. We're not gonna vary that. That's gonna be the difference between sort of the yellow and the blue. We're gonna neglect any, any other changes inside the uh, turbulent region. Now, now this is the connection with Kolmogorov. We're gonna use Kolmogorov scaling for the diffusivity, if you will, you know, uh, Richardson diffusion, if you will. Uh, so a velocity scale, epsilon r to the one third times r, gives you r to the four thirds. We plug that in and we uh, express uh, this as total. So, so what you get is the total flux is gonna be r to the one third. It's the, essentially this four thirds divided by r times the total surface area times things that are constant as function of R, again, the delta C and the dissipation rate of the turbulence. And if this diffusion coefficient properly accounts for the diffusion, the effective diffusion, then this flux should not depend on the scale that we're describing it, right? Like when you run LES, you want the total flux to be the correct flux, uh, not, uh, not something that's dependent on your grid scale. Uh, so we want that to go like R to the zero, uh, if this is properly evaluated based on the turbulent diffusion. And that allows us now to find the scaling for the surface area. That's the crucial aspect. So that from here, obviously we get that the surface area goes like the resolution to the minus one third. And this one third comes from Kolmogorov. And of course it has this property that as R gets to be smaller, right? You're going from here, uh, from C to B to A, the surface area grows. As R goes down, it grows, but it grows in a particular way like R to the minus one third, which has to be the case if this diffusivity grows like R to the one third uh, and then divided by R. So it's such that the flux is constant. So uh, now for fractal surfaces that have these scaling properties, the surface area goes like R squared times R to the minus D from where we conclude that the dimension has to be D plus one third or seven thirds. So, so this, this is kind of the origin of the connection with, uh, 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 with Kolmogorov. And then if you add, you could, Add intermittency corrections, and you get a number of about 2.35. Uh, this, so this, if you're interested, as you can see, this is kind of old. Again, uh, this was in a paper with uh, your speaker from last week uh, in 1990. So, if you're interested, you can find that there. Um, and and there are you know a number of experimental 
verifications of this number close to seven thirds, 2.35, for example, for use, using box counting. And here we've applied it to the PIV data from very high Reynolds number boundary layer experiments at, uh, at uh, Melbourne. So these are, you know, these are RE tau Reynolds numbers between 10 and 20,000. So very high Reynolds numbers. So you can see interface determined that way has a huge range of big bulges, smaller ones, and then tiny, tiny ones. And when you plot, when you want to find the scaling exponent, you need to plot it in a log log plot. And then you need really to be convincing, you really need huge differences between the integral scale and the Komogorov scale. And if you're lucky, you might get sort of one decade of power law behavior uh, between these uh, scales. And indeed, you know, clearly the data falls, you know, between minus one and minus two, somewhere around one third in between, which is kind of co you know, corresponds to this dimension. So again, you know, we thought this, okay, this is now well known. It's been reproduced by a number of people. And it's again, something of interest to very high Reynolds number turbulence. Question now is, to what degree is this applicable to anything having to do with transition at moderate Reynolds numbers? So uh, now here you see, take this spot, spot A. Imagine I did a box counting on spot A. Uh, it's impossible, right? Because the integral scale cannot be bigger, you know, the large scale cannot be bigger than the spot. And the small scale is just maybe, I don't know, one fifth or one tenth at most of it. And if you did this in a log log plot, you would get a big curve with no power law scaling whatsoever. Uh, but as it turns out, if, if you believe that the surface is, has scaling properties as a, as a whole, if you take the whole set of these spots as sort of a, a single entity, uh, then you can use the scale range of the spots themselves to provide additional scale range in some sense. So here's a big one, here's a small one. So if I put it all together, perhaps uh, there is sufficient scale range to, for us to examine this question. And as it turns out, there is a kind of a generalization of, uh, of uh, perimeter area, which, uh, which, you, which you could call surface to volume relation, which says that for a surface that has uh, scaling properties, this surface area as function, if you plot it as function of the volume that's enclosed in the surface area, it'll go like the volume, the enclosed volume to the D over three. And, um, and uh, yeah, and, and so obviously this works if you have a smooth surface, a sphere, for example, the area of the sphere will go like the volume to the two thirds. So D is the uh, dimension. And, and of course, for smooth surfaces, it will go to the right value. Now from the database, we have about identified with the machine learning approach, we have about 4,000 spots identified. Um, and so what you want to do now is not do box counting on the surface, but to just measure the total surface area of a spot and measure its volume. And that'll give you a dot, a point in, the, in a plot that you can now generate. You can generate a log log plot of the area versus volume, and you get a dot for each of the uh, spots. And so we, we will, we anticipate we're going to get 4,000 dots. And we'd like to know whether this falls on a uh, power law relationship or not. And so this is what we found, uh, as you can see. Um, and uh, indeed it does over, you know, over almost five decades, uh, four and a half decades of uh, scaling in volume. So four and a half decades, um, clearly a power law. Uh, and, you know, between slope one and two thirds. So two thirds would be the, the trivial, you know, if the surfaces were smooth, it'd be two thirds. Clearly the slope is uh, 0.79 uh, with a very small error. So we put it a straight line. And uh, again, if you, if you now plug that into this D over three relation, you got to multiply this number by three and you get the 2.36, which is awfully close to 2.35, certainly within experimental error. And so uh, uh, quite surprising uh, that it actually does agree with this very high Reynolds number limit, even for this very low uh, moderate uh, transitional Reynolds number for the spots. Um, the uh, next uh, uh, surprise was we, we did this even for individual spots. So, so what you see on the right is a log log plot of the area versus volume of, um, of, 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 these pair of, of, of these pair of spots. So I think here the yellow is one, the red is the other one. And then here the, uh, the, the, you know, they, they sort of separate and come back together and so on, but they evolve along something that, again, looks very much like power law with very similar exponent. And it, for, for example, here, what happens is these two spots now in, the, in between, they merge, and each of these now is the merged uh, 
uh, spot, a uh, uh, single spot that keeps evolving along this, uh, this uh, power law. So uh, we thought that was uh, quite interesting. Um, and um, so in a way, the, uh, the conclusion we reached is simply that this is another feature of spots in a turbulent bypass transition uh, that shares features with very, very high runoff number turbulence, even in its incipient state. And um, you know, what, what to do with it is of course another question and we, we haven't really progressed along that direction, but you could think of uh, saying things like, well, if there are some analytical uh, models that might be derived from first principles that might give us some hints as to the evolution of these spots at very low Reynolds numbers. Uh, and so, for example, if somebody comes up with a theory that, that says at very low Reynolds number during transition, the relationship between the surface area and the volume of turbulent spots is such and such, and let's say it agrees with this number, this, uh, this scaling behavior, uh, then perhaps that's a way of explaining the asymptotically very high Reynolds number. Case. Again, that's uh, possibly wishful thinking, but it, uh, I think it does open up some interesting new ideas. And that really concludes uh, what I wanted to uh, tell you about today. So um, again, let me perhaps uh, summarize. So we've uh, kind of used this study of turbulent spots as a, as a kind of a individualized uh, study of one thing that you can do with the kind of data that's available. Uh, for this application, we found that uh, this sort of, sort of unsupervised machine learning turned out to be really successful at, uh, at identifying the turbulent, non-turbulent interface. Maybe let me make a little pause here and tell those of you who might say, oh, gee, how about generalizing this? Uh, let me tell you right away that that became more difficult. So for example, we played around with saying, oh, how about you know, dividing the plot, the, the space into three regions, uh, for example, laminar and then turbulent, but within the turbulent, how about subdividing into vertical and strain dominated regions or, or some other thing? Um, and none, none of those things worked. Uh, somehow, uh, all of the possible generalizations that we played around with uh, somehow weren't quite as successful as uh, this. This one kind of worked out of the box. Other things uh, weren't quite that way. So it's you know, I'm certainly not saying that machine learning here will solve all the problems, but for this application, it really did work nicely. Um, again, uh, I think I uh, convinced hope I convinced you that uh, even for this very moderate Reynolds number, the uh, geometry of the turbulent and non-turbulent interface does display features that are common with very high Reynolds number turbulence. Um, and again, maybe if you uh, come away with something from this presentation, uh, next time you look at the cumulus cloud, uh, think that you might be looking at the most visible manifestation of polar scaling and turbulence. Uh, you will not visually be able to see any corrections due to small scale intermittency, but uh, and again, uh, overall, it's, I think it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting observation. Um, I should add that in a paper that's, uh, that's uh, under review for PRF, we've applied this uh, SOM, uh, this machine learning uh, uh, inspired uh, separation between lemon and turbulent to well modeled LES to, you know, using it as a sensor. So, you know, what we just, what we find to be turbulent, we use a, a wall model that says it's turbulent, and then we use wall resolved and the laminar portions, and, and, and uh, that turned out to give uh, interesting uh, and good results in, in some of the simulations we did in transitional channel flow in this case. Um, and then maybe going back to the first part, uh, lessons learned from this uh, database system, which again, if, if you haven't used it, uh, you, certainly everybody is welcome to access it. Um, we do believe that this, this way of sharing data is, uh, is possible and, and I think does amplify investments in HPC for, for funding agencies and so on. And also really what I think the key element is that new communities really can make use of the data in, in different ways now. It's essentially mathematicians, experimentalists that before really had to really beg perhaps as the simulators to to somehow tell them how to use the data, this, this makes it entirely independent. Uh, they can just very easily get the data. Again, not all the data, subsets of the data that they need, not the, you know, not the half of petabyte of data. So sometimes we get used, you know, we get asked, uh, oh, could I have uh, all of the data? Uh, could you ship me disks, hard disks and so on? And we, we say, no, that's not the idea. So again, smartly decided subsets of the data, uh, otherwise it's, you're better off running your own DNS. 
Um, I should say that putting up each of the data sets, there's a lot of effort. So this is very different from just storing files in a, in a, in a disk somewhere. I, I personally, I believe maybe, you know, each new data set, it's like the effort of writing two or three or four papers. Uh, essentially, it's like writing a paper. You're, you're putting data available for people to read. It's very much like writing a paper. Um, and uh, again, we've, we haven't succeeded to make like an automatic pipeline for data ingest. And perhaps it's not possible because every flow is slightly different, needs slightly different quantities, the numerical methods to take derivatives and the channel flow is different from isotropic turbulence. Uh, and, and all of this requires uh, quite a bit of knowledge of the data itself. And so we just uh, bite the bullet and do it sort of uh, almost manually for each case uh, very carefully. And again, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, let you know that a, a new generation uh, for the database system has recently been funded by NSF. And so uh, we'll, um, we'll, we'll be able to continue serving up these data for the community. And with that, um, I thank you and uh, we'll be very happy to answer any questions. So well, thank you very much Shab, for, uh, for this uh, presentation. And uh, well, I would say that's just open the stage for questions. So whoever wants can just, uh, uh, unmute the mic and uh, uh, go ahead asking the question. Yeah, yeah, please, Martin, go ahead. Hi, George, uh, good to see you here. <laughs> At least from the distance, a few thousand kilometers apart from each other. Uh, thanks for the great talk, actually, wonderful work. Um, I'm particularly interested in the machine learning part. I think you showed one uh, figure where you had this inclined plane where you had to say spots and color blinds. So I don't know which color it was, but I could distinguish. Could, could you bring that up again, please? Sure, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I believe you are referring to, uh, sorry, went too far as usual. Yeah, this figure. Exactly, what was not fully clear to me I mean, is that the, I think the one is red and the other is green, right, or not? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> um, so how did the machine, so to say, put this in this plane or what distinguished it, these two areas now in terms of feature? I mean, what, that wasn't really cl clear to me, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, very, very good. Thanks, thanks for asking that. So, so what the, what the self-organized map does is you prescribe two. So we said separate into two classes. That's, that's user prescribed. So we said that. And now what, what, the, what the method does, I mean, you could almost, it places, you, I don't know if you can see those two uh, black crosses. Yeah, yeah, we do. They're visible. So, so th what the SOM does, it positions those crosses iterative. So it, it has something where it kind of moves around iteratively. And it's, you can imagine it's a bit like, you know, maximizing the intra scale variance and minimizing the difference, some, something along those lines where those are the two points where, where two clusters are most visibly clustered around those two points. I see. So it's like a center of mass of a certain feature. It's, it's, it's a center of, it's two centers of mass that somehow optimize the distinctness of these two classes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and, uh, yeah, I see. So and then all it does, it, it just places this hyperplane in the middle, you know, the middle between the two and, and at an angle such that, again, it separates these two classes. Right. And in this particular case here, I understand, well, you have X is, or oh, that is the X position, and you just have two derivatives, right? That's that right. One is the U D Y and the other is the right. W D Y. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So what's, what's more difficult to visualize is in 16 or 17 dimensional phase space, but it's essentially the same idea. There, of course, it'll be much sparser and much mm -hmm. sort of non-trivial, you know, what, what lies on one side. And we don't know. We, we've tried to look at different cuts and so on. It's very difficult. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, please go ahead with the next question. I think Alan, Alan. Uh, yes. Uh, hey, Alan. <laughs> Hi, Charles. Absolutely fascinating. Um, how far can you uh, push this analogy to High Reynolds number turbulence? Can you look, for instance, for the analog of a Komogorov microscale scaling somehow 
in the way that would even infer what the Reynolds number? Is? Yeah, so, right, right. I, I, so we didn't really pursue that too much because a lot of other people have done that. And so, for example, you know, PDFs within the turbulent region look very much like the PDF of turbulent fluctuations in fully developed channel flow and, and so on. So, so uh, I guess, you know, you can, you know, if you, if, you, if you ask about a local Reynolds number, it's still pretty low. I think, you know, the, the local R tau, R e tau still will be fairly low in, you know, if you do conditional averaging, it's still moderate to low Reynolds number turbulence. It's, so, so you can ask those questions and there's some, you know, features again that are common to turbulence, but, but not of like, you know, very high Reynolds number turbulence. I don't know if that's what you're, what you're asking. Yeah, well, I was curious if even collectively, in other words, is there a, some signature of a high Reynolds number? In other words, uh, within a spot, it may be a, a low Reynolds number in terms of the individual spot, but whether the collection has other high Reynolds number sig signature? I think, I think the answer is, is yes. Uh, so I think the answer is yes. High, maybe high Reynolds number, meaning higher than what you might expect for the overall global average, but not, you know, huge, you know, but, but high, you know, higher Reynolds numbers, sort of more closer to perhaps what one might think is equilibrium turbulence. And then again, other, there's a, there's a literature on that with other people having looked at conditional profiles of Reynolds stress distributions, uh, 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 even velocity profiles of PDFs and so on. Spectra, you cannot really do because uh, it's highly non-homogeneous, but, uh, so I think overall the feeling is yes, there, there are features that look like higher Reynolds numbers. And Can you clarify the meaning of bypass transition in this context? Because it seems like it's not really bypassing the cascade. You're showing with this. Okay, yeah. So, so this, this is language from transitional uh, uh, boundary layer flows. Bypass meaning uh, the free stream has some level of turbulence. So there's the free stream that come, comes in has some level of turbulence which triggers these spots. So these spots are actually triggered by the free stream turbulence that comes in rather than natural transition that develops with Tolmin Schlichting waves and second modes and those kind of you know, the, the secondary uh, modes and so on. So bypass in that sense, it bypasses the nat natural transition process. Oh, it doesn't bypass the cascade. Okay, it doesn't great. bypass the cascade. No, it bypasses the natural transition process because it has free stream turbulence, which by the way is another interesting thing that this machine learning somehow separated the, the turbulent boundary layer turbulence from the free stream, which is much weaker, but it's still there. So it's not entirely laminar. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I see that uh, there is someone else who wants to ask a question. So please go ahead, just unmute your mic, yes. Uh, you, you, need muted. Unmute your... muted. you need it to unmute. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, thank you again for this wonderful talk. Uh, I'd like to, to um, uh, push further the, the, the previous question. And, and, and uh, can, can we go back to the, to the picture where, where you, you have the diagram relating uh, uh, the volume of the spot with the area of the spot? And you have this nice uh, scaling with the uh, the uh, fractal dimension, and uh, yes, that one. So uh, actually, the scaling looks pretty good at at large volumes, but at small volumes, uh, the envelope of the of the points uh, actually span a relatively wide uh, uh, range. I mean, this is, these are log scales, so the, the lower bound is 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 closer to two thirds, and and the upper bound is closer to one. So, um, do you really think that uh, uh, this idea of using the Kolmogorov scaling for small spots is 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 well? Um, uh, acceptable? <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I think uh, that's a very good question. I think it's, you know, the same, the same statement as, as to say, you know, the energy in eddies of scale R is epsilon to the two, one third R to the one third. That's not, that's not going to be something that's valid for each realization. It, it is a statistical statement. The most likely or the expected or the mean behavior is like this, and there's going to be variations uh, uh, around it. Uh, in fact, this this particular set of spots that we followed, you know, the slope here, exactly like you said, is not exactly 0.79. It's, I think it's like 10% off or something. 
So I believe there will be, you know, there will be fluctuations around the Kolmogorov value, perhaps uh, another manifestation of intermittency in some sense. So I do believe that uh, that to be the case. So I, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, Christos, hey. I don't, I can't hear you somehow. Christos, Christos we cannot hear you. Even though he doesn't seem to be muted from the. Well, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Ah, okay. There was a wrong switch. Okay. <laughs> so I said I had two questions. I will ask the first one. Um, first, obviously. Um, you mentioned at some point that obviously at the TNTI is very homogeneous, clearly. And uh, you use the Kolmogorov theory to obtain the dimension of the TNTI. But the Kolmogorov theory is written for homogeneous turbulence. Yeah. yeah. Is there a problem there? Uh, yes, that's, uh, a yes big, that's a big, very good point. Very good point. Uh, uh, I think I have an echo now. So, Christos, maybe you need to mute yourself again. Okay, now it's good actually. Okay, so yeah, so for thank you. Yeah, so for your first question, um, yes, um, absolutely. Uh, I think that was you know certainly one of those surprises that uh, oh, it, because this is a highly non-homogeneous flow. So let me tell you uh, uh, a, another study we made as part of this, where we did the the study on area perimeter at different planes at different heights above the wall, and then you can do the same thing. You know, you do. Uh, area perimeter uh, relationship. And, uh, and, and there we did see a little bit of a Y dependence. So it started out with the same value. And then at the height where these streaks were the strongest, the dimension dropped. Uh, so we just dropped, you know, instead of 1.35, it went down to 1.2 actually. And then when we went back, you know, further up in where most of the skin is located, it went back to, the, to 1.35, let's say. So you're absolutely right. There is, there is a, in the signal, in the data, there is a, uh, a kind of a, a signature of spatial non-homogeneity, uh, but it turns out that overall, the overall average, again, coming back also perhaps to the previous point, still complies with Kolmogorov because the surface, the majority of the area is actually at, on the top. It's like the top skin of the spots, not the side. But if the side was the dominant total area, I believe we would have seen a, a stronger Y dependence, perhaps. I don't know if that, so, so you're, you're right. There are signals, there are dependencies on height in this flow that didn't affect the overall average. But if you do careful conditional average on height, uh, you do see a spatial non-homogeneity effects. Okay, thanks. Actually, I often found the mental which are different from 2.3. So you confirm that. So that's, uh, there may be different reasons. The second question is, you find the TNTI with the machine learning technique, which is nice because you don't depend on threshold. However, you find a dimension which previously you and others found with the threshold technique. So there must be some kind of threshold of vorticity, say, which has the dimension you're talking about at the interface. But actually, if you go to a threshold next to it at the interface, another one, then another one, eventually the interface will become smooth because you will enter into the laminar place. So which one of those thresholds is the one that has the Kolmogorov behavior? Or do they all have it and then suddenly you drop the non-Kolmogorov? Uh, yeah, so, so I think that, that you know, we, didn't, we did not really look at that in the detail that is necessary to answer what you're saying. I believe perhaps if I, if I go back and look at the examples, for example, from Borel and Jimenez where they did the, so here, so, for example, here on the bottom left, you can see they've uh, there's a you know in intelligently chosen way of redefining the vorticity such that PDFs will have some kind of plateau behavior, and uh, I believe it, you know if, if somewhere in between here uh, the, the the dimension will agree with what uh, what we, we chose, but even between these two plateaus, the, the surface looks very different. So somewhere you know the, your the answer to your question is some threshold somewhere here in between will be the one that gives the result. Um, if I had chosen other vorticity values, maybe it will be in the different results. Yeah, so there is some dependence on the threshold if you set the threshold on vorticity. Now the machine, learning, the machine uh -huh. learning way of choosing it though, 
is not based on vorticity because it's, there's not a single one-to-one -one relationship between the machine learning and this one. So maybe that's, I should maybe correct what you seem to imply because the, because the machine learning is one threshold for the entire flow for all heights, for all vorticity, for everything. Um, it's a bit you know, mysterious why it works, but it, it, I think on this plot, it would probably map onto some you know, line that, that does, you know, might not even be sharp, so. Okay, interesting. We could go on forever, but we will do it another time. Bye-bye, Charles. Okay. So is there any more questions? Uh, I have one more question, if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Charles, um, can you go back to the one slide you just showed us earlier where you had this, you know, nice um, fitting over several decades? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, this one, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, did you ever look at PDFs um, of, of um, these quantities? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, I seem to, you know, in a way, I think you can see, even though these dots are a little big, so it's not that obvious to look at PDFs, but you could, you could imagine a joint PDF of this, you know, being a very elongated, you know, ellipse with a lot of points here. And, you know, as was mentioned, some, some thickness here, some, some variance in both directions. Um, I, I don't think there's any particularly stunning uh, thing from the from the PDF. So yeah, I yeah I'm asking that. I mean because you know we some some years ago we and we still be heavily using it right now. We found this additional symmetries we called statistical symmetries, and we actually one of them we called intermittency symmetry because it has a certain um, type of scaling which is so to say non-intuitive and not so to say dimensionally based. Mm -hmm. And that is admitted by PDF equation, but it's also visible in moment equation and things. So I was just wondering, I mean, if, if you look at PDFs, in any case, I, I, I mean, is that all described in the paper you just mentioned at the end of your talk? Yeah, but not, not the PDFs, though, I think. Uh, no, 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 that's fine. Uh, but, but, uh, but the yeah. rest of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I will, I will look at that. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, any more questions? So if you have any question, just feel free to unmute your mic and uh, ask directly. Or either if you, uh, if you want to, to write it in the chat, I can report it. Yes, so there is actually a question in the, in the chat. Um, it asks, could you uh, repeat what kind of vorticity isosurfaces you used in the animation you showed? Yes, yes, very good. Uh, yeah, let me, let me go back and that gives me an opportunity to just show that again. Uh, thank you for the question. And there is actually a second question connected to it. What was, uh, particularly, what was the red surface inside the opaque uh, yeah. face surface representing? Yeah, so these are, these are, so what you're looking at for both surfaces, both the gray transparent and the red, these are vorticity magnitude surfaces. Uh, we, we could have also used Q criterion. I think the results for this case might not, not, not have been very different, but these are just, these are vorticity magnitudes. And I, I don't know, I don't re recall the actual value, but it's whatever this magnitude is to see these small scale vortices. So again, the, the red is unfiltered vorticity but the gray is filtered, I believe, in this case, maybe a box of size 30 Kolmogorov scales or 20 Kolmogorov scales or something like that. So you filter the velocity at 20 or 30 Kolmogorov scales, then you calculate the vorticity, and then you take the magnitude of that. So what's, what's happening is, you know, if the small scale vorticity, if those vortices are all aligned, then even when you filter at bigger scales, you still get the vorticity coherently distributed over the bigger scales. Whereas when the small scale vort vorticity lines are randomly oriented, once you filter that goes away and you get nothing. And so that, that's what this is supposed to show. I don't know if, if I answered your question. Okay. Um, okay, is there, is there, yes. So the, the person who asked the question actually replied uh, that this, the reply was satisfactory to, to him. 
Um, is there someone, uh, someone else who wants to, to, to raise a point, to ask a question? Uh, Charles, maybe I can ask the question on the uh, connection, or let's say that you get um, large um, uh, Reynolds number effects from low Reynolds numbers. That reminds me a little bit of what um, Victor Jakob, Srinivasan, and Jörg Schumacher is doing um, also to have the scaling in the Reynolds number and get something for structure functions. Is there a relation to your work? Uh, I. That is a very good point. Thank you, Reiner. Good to see you. Um, I yes, we I, I in fact we cite that paper in the in our paper as another example of exactly that kind of possible connection. Uh, I I I think that's as as much as I can say about it. But I think the the, the conceptual idea, and which in this case was for let's say isotropic turbulence, just showing that features of the there are signatures of very high Reynolds number scaling of intermittency corrections already at very, very low Reynolds numbers uh, 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 visible somehow. Yes, so it's, it's in that same spirit, I would say. Um, that's it. Yeah, thanks. Um, and maybe also it gives a chance to, um, let's say, to, to use the same te techniques or the same ideas that Victor Jakob uses for your problem. That's yes, in, yes, indeed, that's a good idea. Yeah, in fact, that that, that we have not um, right. I I think um, yeah. I mean, you know, if there is a way of starting at low Reynolds number, let's say Stokes flow, and then doing perturbative approaches, sort of RNG type things, to approach you know how nonlinearity starts creeping into the problem, and if you can say things about you know, very high Reynolds number turbulence based on this kind of approaches, that would be great. So that, that's the hope. And I don't uh, claim to have anything, yeah. any results about it, but I agree with you that that's exactly the, the, the direction I think that this uh, kind of motivates. It would be very interesting. Yeah. Thanks. I think uh, Sarp has raised the hand. I yes. yes, hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I have, um, small question about um, have you uh, with your TNTI detection method um, how it works with the entrained internal volumes for example yeah we, if, we have yeah we have not um, analyzed uh, again if, if there are in, entrained internal volumes that are that are small they will they will get be gotten rid of by this uh, by this uh, whole filling procedure that I mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we just, you know, we dealt with that in sort of a signals processing way, not really asking too much about the physics in that particular case. I don't know if that's what you're, what you're referring uh, to, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I was curious if, uh, if, the, if the algorithm um, is able to find the outer surface re or it's, it's just uh, really separating just turbulent and non-turbulent, so also giving the interior spots so. right i i would say the way we used it it was only the outer surface and then we, mm -hmm. we sort of if there were little, little inner portions of, of laminar flows we we got rid of those yeah. um, and okay. there were really none of there were very few inside the spots but in the inside the turbulent region on the right which really we didn't study for the spot study um, that's where these got, got got rid of but uh, again i think the yeah, what, what, this, what this power law behavior tells you is somehow that the rate of growth of the volume is of course <laughs> determined by how much surface area there is, how much you have turbulence touching the non-turbulent. And so <laughs> the rate of growth of the volume is somehow related with that surface area. Um, <laughs> but more than that, we haven't, you know, we haven't really uh, done more than that. And when, when we were talking about all these um... Uh, futures of the surface. The surface we're talking about is uh, something a bit extra abstract to understand. I guess, with, as you as you mentioned, with the high dimensional space and its uh, hyperplane. So, I think the, the the condition changes also in the space. Yeah. So I think I think you know the way to answer your question, I believe, is is as follows: the surface we identified is the surface that you, as a human, when you look at 
at these contours or color maps of velocity or vorticity or whatever, you would say, ah, this is the, this is the interface. This is mm -hmm. where my eye tells me it's laminar and terminal. That's all. It's, it's very strange. It's a very, it in a way it's subjective, but everybody who looks at it says, this is turbulent, this is laminar. Yes, it's a bit counterintuitive to see that uh, that the computer is doing. That's right. So. Yeah. Well, I believe I believe that's what machine learning is supposed to be all about, and in this case, it did seem to to do the trick. But I, yeah. so again, we are not identifying a surface that's where the kinetic energy is lower or vorticity higher, and and so on. It's uh, it's just a melange of all these things that happens to agree with what we when we look at it, it seems to. Yeah, yeah. Seems I, even less, even. Uh, as uh, evolution of the structure, so uh, when right. you're looking at different instance of the that then completely at the same spot in the space, there's a new threshold with sixteen different uh, parameters. Re that that is correct. And remember, it's not as I guess it's a, it's a threshold for that ISO plane which we didn't see set. We just set it in the mid plane. And, and the plane is always uh, in the uh, middle. Uh, it's always in the middle. I plane. could move yeah. that plane, right? I could move that plane in the hyperspace. You know, instead of 50%, I could move it at 30% mm -hmm. of, and there, by the way, that when you go back into physical space, it remains roughly there. The, the, that surface doesn't really change much, surprisingly. So, so it's very robust to that position. So we just took the kind of, uh, you know, the commercial software code uh, default value of one half, but mm -hmm. <coughs> it's quite yeah. uh, insensitive to it. And can I also ask if, the, if this code is... Uh... Kind of open source or available or yeah the this som is uh, is one of the matlab you know in matlab i think uh Zhao used the matlab uh, uh, so it's matlab i guess it's not open source but uh i there, there are many versions of this so you know unsupervised uh, i guess a self-organized map or k-means would work just the same so these are hmm. standard machine learning type of things they're they're okay they're just clustering classifier techniques very okay okay Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, there is actually a report another question from the from the chat. Then, uh, um, so uh, ah, I just asked, yeah, uh, yeah uh, uh, right. um, the growth of spots is associated to any inverse cascade process. Yeah, that's a that's an intriguing, uh, interesting idea. Um, certainly, certainly the scale of the spots is getting bigger, and so uh, you know, if you just look at the turbulence energy, it's uh, initially residing at, at smaller scales and going to bigger scales, I suppose. Uh, and also, it's mostly kind of in a two-dimensional thing. But um, yeah, I guess yeah, one one would need to look at the precise rate at which energy, uh, at, at which the cascade is actually going on, which is different from merger of spots. So I think it's a good question. Um, I'm, I, I hesitate to give a kind of an off the hip uh, answer to it. I think it's definitely not the traditional view of inverse cascade where you, know, where you have uh, a merger of structures that, that then the entire structure gets bigger because the spot isn't really, you know, isn't really one big, coherent structure, it's a, it's, it consists of many smaller ones as well that just happen to have merged. So, um, so, so, but the answer is yes, I do believe it's, it's a inverse cascade process, but probably not the, the same one we're used to for, for two-dimensional turbulence. Okay. Um, Great, yeah, exactly, yeah, thank you. So is there, uh, are there any more any more questions? Uh, I don't see any in the chat. So yeah, if if there are no more uh, no more questions, then uh, I invite everyone to thank our speaker again. Thank you, Shark, for uh, this very very interesting and uh, presentation and for the discussion which followed that uh, it was, as you could see, it was uh, very lively and uh, uh, thanks once again. Great, thank you. Thanks for the excellent questions and it was a pleasure. Thanks, Charles. Take care. Oh, thank yeah, you. Good to see you guys. Bye. Bye, Francesco. Bye. Thanks, Charles.